around the world. And I'm going to name names. And I'm going to ask you uh, whether you agree with this list. So how many have been to Vienna, uh, to, to Vienna Austria? Yeah, sophisticated crew. It's number one. And then uh, the rest of the top ten, Zurich, Auckland, so how, many, how many people have been to Munich? Uh, Vancouver at number five, and Bern and Sydney. Folks, do you see Asia on the board? Is anyone angry? We, and, and so that's going to be one of the themes of, of, of these lectures. Let's keep going. I see I have everyone's full attention. So w w Mercer is a consulting company, and they're getting paid Multinational firms want to know how much do they have to pay foreign employees to live in a city. So if a city's nasty, you're going to have to pay a compensating differential, what I call combat pay, to recruit folks. So uh, let's keep going. I was going to think of an experiment. Let's go to the United States. Honolulu is our best-ranked city. How many of you have been there? And it's ranked better than San Francisco, Boston at 35. I was born in Chicago, and maybe that's why it's ranked 42nd. Washington, D.C. is 43rd. Detroit is the low man on this totem pole. Folks, notice that Los Angeles and New York City don't make the rating. It's interesting. And now we turn to Asia. In Asia, Singapore is 25th. It, 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 does anyone want to boo? Is, is that fair to Singapore as, as we think of the, the world cities of ranking Singapore 25th in terms of quality of life? And then some Japanese cities and China, China cities are a, a little bit lower. Shanghai, where I was just at six weeks ago at number 95, are other major Asian cities in the top 100. And folks, unfortunately, someone has to be low on the list. Uh, is anyone a frequent traveler to these cities? And, and, and so a very interesting question to me is, uh, we can debate, is this a reasonable ranking? And different people might have different rankings. But the first intellectual question I want to ask my smart students, does anyone want to drop this class? <laughs> the first question I want to ask my talented students is as, as academics and as policy makers, if you wanted to do a serious job ranking your own city's quality of life, ranking the same city's quality of life over time, say in the year 1990, 2013, 2023, how would you go about coming up with an objective measure of quality of life? Uh, and, and I want us to begin to think about that. In a world of diversity, would your ranking of quality of life differ depending on a person's age? My parents live in New York City, and they say that it's a great place to be a senior citizen. And of course, in this age of income inequality, is living in Singapore a very different experience if you're in the top 1% versus if you're a poorer household? And so I, these are some of the questions I want us to begin to think about, and I'm going to provide some answers, but my students always say I pose more questions than I give answers. And I say, well, that's why there's the next generation. Uh, I, I, it, it's, um, that was supposed to be funny, but it's um, yeah, on, on your quiz later. That will be on it. The, I also, when you think about city quality of life, if you think of a city as a collection of neighborhoods, I'm also very interested in how quality of life and about how environmental challenges vary across neighborhoods within a city. In my second trip to Singapore, I've been very impressed that it appears to me as an outsider that there's, le let me say it in a positive way, Los Angeles, my hometown, has more diversity of neighborhoods. That there's some very tough neighborhoods and there's some sort of Kardashian, Beverly Hills neighborhoods. In Singapore, I see a more uniform distribution of quality of life. And I, perhaps I'm incorrect about that, but that interests me. So as a social scientist, let's begin to talk about the ingredients of a quality of life ranking. So what's fascinating about Singapore is I view this city, as a state, as having very high quality of life, but it's a little bit humid here. I, uh, and, and, and so in the United States, uh, how many of you have been to San Francisco? How many of you have been to Houston? 
It's, um, and, and so in the United States, th the South has grown tremendously over the last 50 years, but many folks say it's awfully humid uh, with awfully hot summers. And so us, it, in many studies of quality of life in the United States, uh, having, it's a rare location in the United States that has warm winters and cool summers. And of course, one of the major ways if people like warm winters but temperate summers is the introduction of air conditioning. But, but so climate conditions are a big chunk of any ranking of quality of life. Uh, one of our themes in what we're going to do over the next couple of nights is our discussion of pollution. And there's a whole set of criteria here, uh, air pollution, water pollution, of, uh, of, of, of garbage being picked up, of different cities and different neighborhoods differ on this criteria. There's a whole literature in urban and real estate economics and in, in urban planning about public services, schooling quality at public schools, street safety, litter. So my wife is half Italian and we sometimes go to Rome. Has anyone here been to Rome recently? Did anyone notice any uh, garbage on the streets of Rome? Maybe we're at a different we were at different places. Did anyone notice any graffiti or dog poop? And so different cities, uh, maybe we should turn off the recording, different cities face different challenges in day-to-day -day quality of life. Things you might not see in Singapore are in ample supply on the Rome streets uh, and, and, and with, with smoking everywhere. And that might be, uh, uh, some people may enjoy smoking, but there's an externality associated with such actions that uh, smokers unintentionally affect the quality of life of, of many of their neighbors. A traffic congestion is a classic challenge that many American cities face. They have not introduced road pricing. As you zoom around Singapore at 35 miles per hour, uh, it's impressive what road pricing has done to improve Singapore's quality of life. But folks, one of the themes of my lectures is that there's no free lunch. Uh, who uh, in, in Los Angeles, when you're stuck in traffic, you pay zero to be there. Uh, can anyone name what is the charge to go through Singapore, when you go through one of the road, what is the price? Two dollars. Well, maybe I am willing to pay that. Fair enough. But I know that cars are expensive, and I know that a number of incentives have been introduced in Singapore to, uh, to limit uh, the number of cars and to encourage people to use public transit. Green space. I see in Singapore many towers where people live, but I also see a commitment to green space. So folks, with my list here, uh, what I immediately see that I'm missing is I didn't have a category for uh, diversity of restaurants. What other criteria would you want the professor to add if I was going to have very small font? In your recipe for having a great city to live in, what's missing? And, and class participation is 12% of your grade. Peace of mind. So there's a fascinating question. I wish I had peace of mind. There's a question of how that's produced and whether... Uh, of, uh, so, so in the United States right now, there are questions co coming out of the recession of do people have peace of mind or worried about job security, worried about unemployment. That, I'm not going to be talking much about that, but that's sort of a macroeconomic topic. One of the themes of my lectures is going to be those cities that offer high quality of life are likely to attract new employers to locate. Folks, it's no accident that Facebook and Google are in Los Angeles. There's nothing intrinsically productive about many parts of California. The, these companies, one of my themes is that many companies seek out high quality of life places because ambitious, skilled people want to live in those places. And so a so, so peace of mind uh, comes from having a job, and I'm going to argue that those locations, those cities that offer excellent quality of life, can be confident that their economies can withstand recessions to existing industries because other industries will pop up. So Los Angeles used to be a center of, of military production, but uh, those industries have declined, and new industries have arisen in Los Angeles because of the demand of workers to live there. Folks, what else is missing in my list? 
So I put public transportation, I agree with you, I would put that under public services and traffic congestion. But, but of course you're right. So cost of living is a crucial one. Folks, there's no free lunch. If a city is paradise, how, what are real estate prices going to be? I'm your entertainment. The, um, the, but let, let's, let's come back to housing affordability. Folks, if all people care about is housing affordability, then I say let the pollution go, let the criminals out, let's put the garbage on the street, let's knock out all the parks. You can have a very affordable city if you build a nightmare. Uh, and, and so there is no free lunch. Uh, and so for one of our themes is going to be that green cities are often expensive places to live in, that quality commands a price premium, and how the middle class can afford such cities is a topic we need to speak about. Entertainment was mentioned. I would say that entertainment is an emerging property. If you have a good weather and low pollution, and it's safe, and you have green space, entertainment's going to emerge. There's going to be street comics. I was out, I was out near the city center the other night, and, and th there was a whole bunch of entertainers there. And so the entertainers emerged because people were walking and enjoying the city. Would any entertainer come out if there's nobody walking around because they're afraid of crime? And so, so my point is, is, you guys get an A for, for your excellent answers. But my second point is, is you get a vibrant city. Whether these are necessary and sufficient conditions for having a vibrant city, I don't know. But I, I believe they are, but that needs to be studied. So a first important point I want to stress to everyone, and folks, please, at, at any time, uh, <coughs> ask me a question. I have a lot of stuff to show you, and so I, as an economist, will do a cost-benefit analysis on how much time I want to spend on your question, but I'm very eager to hear from you. The first point I want to bring across is that a city's quality of life can change over time. San Francisco, th there's no law of physics that San Francisco or at Tokyo has to remain a great place to live. There are cities. So, folks, I lived in New York City in the 1970s when it was a risky, ugly, dirty city. Nothing like what Mike Bloomberg has built now. Chicago, Pittsburgh, other U.S. cities have had remarkable dynamics in terms of their quality of life. In much of my research, I have pointed to industrial transition. For every city, one second, sir. For every city you can think of, what's the golden goose of that city? What is the engine of that city's economy? If it happens to be a dirty industry like steel or oil refining, that city is going to face greater challenges in being a green city than if it has a focus like a Silicon Valley or a, a focus revolving around services or around university graduates. Sir? I can't hear you, sir. I have trouble hearing. So I am not a philosopher, and these are my lectures. Let me ask you a question. Would you like to live in a high-polluted city? No. Would you like to live in a city with bad schools, with, with litter, with, with crime? No. So we can all agree that these are things we want. Can we all agree on that? Or are these going to be a bad four days? <laughs> Where we might disagree is on the weights you place on these. I went to the University of Chicago, an excellent university, where the Nobel laureates were very tough on us. We would walk in, and they would tell us that we were stupid and weak. I wish that they had come out and hugged me and said, you're likely to be the next Milton Friedman. I went to a university with excellent minds where the faculty were nasty. I wish that I could have gotten to a university which was excellent, where the faculty were wonderful people. We face trade-offs. I was not admitted to a university that offered those amenities, and I'm a stronger man because I went to this, uh, this tough place. And so we always face trade-offs. And so I want to give you an answer to your question, but I have 40 more slides to show you before break. And I don't know you. I don't know your priorities. My point is, is that for every city, at every point in time, the different cities and different neighborhoods offered bundles of attributes. You know yourself. If, if you're a young man who doesn't mind the humidity but cares very much about pollution, then, then a certain part of Singapore might be a very 
better place for you than a city that has traffic congestion but, but very good schools. And so where he's absolutely right, and to be fair to him, whilst social scientists can rank areas on these criteria, different people might have different priorities. And it's the job of a social scientist in a diverse world to try to measure that. And I've actually tried to work on that in several uh, statistical papers I've written. And so he's, so I agree with him that, that any ranking of cities is not going to be a universal ranking. And so I think that that's a very fair point. And I think uh, we can come back to that in the question and answers. So this was Mercer speaking. This was not Matthew Kahn speaking. Because I'm sure that there are people living in, I can't pronounce it. Folks, help an old professor. Thank you. I, if there was some, I, I'm sure there's some very lovely things about this city. What I want these lectures to focus on is the following. If the mayor, and I can't pronounce it again, young lady, help an old professor, say it. T oh, yeah, yeah, t yeah, big T. If the mayor of Big T is disappointed by his or her ranking, what can he or she do? What's a cost-effective investment to rise from 207 to 203? And, and what, would be the payoff to that, what would be the payoff to the city and to the people who live in that city by moving up in the rankings? And we're, we're going to come back to this. But he is correct that there is no universal ranking of cities. But I am very interested in how do we set up incentives and rules of the game where if a city believes that it's underperforming or is underappreciated in the world's conventional rankings, what can it do beyond perception and public relations to rise in the rankings? But I'm glad you asked that. Yes. One of the themes in my lectures is going to be the role of local, state, and national government in improving a city's quality of life. For example, Los Angeles used to have a crime problem and a major pollution problem, and Los Angeles' quality of life has been improved. There's a reason Kobe Bryant signed on again and again. Uh, the Los Angeles' quality of life has improved because of both policing and the Clean Air Act in the United States. The as a city's quality of life changes, this affects who chooses to migrate to that city. So there's interesting issues that different cities uh, self-select different populations to live in these areas. Um, and we're going to come back later in these lectures to the investment the private sector makes in response to government's investment. So I want to tell a tale of three cities to show you some of my cards. I want to talk a little bit about dynamics. First, I want to praise Singapore, and then I want to crack some jokes about the United States. And I, if that leads to uh, anger, you can uh, throw rocks. I can, you won't hit me. <laughs> so uh, here, is, uh, here is some opulent living at, at the Marina Bay. I stayed uh, for a night right here. Uh, and, and, I, and, and, and so Singapore it, it put, puts an excellent face on, on taking quality of life very seriously. Of course, here's nighttime in downtown Singapore. Folks, here was my L.A. in the 1970s. Does this look sexy to anybody? So do you see a tough group? I'm going to go back to L.A. where I'm appreciated. The, uh, I see a mountain range trapping the haze, and I see an orange glow to the city killing individuals and making it such that you can't spend time outside. It is 75 degrees Fahrenheit, not Celsius, every day in Los Angeles. And yet, can you spend time outside in this? And so this was Los Angeles in the 1970s. The cause of this was oil refineries and pollution from vehicles. And yet now, this is L.A. During a time of economic growth, when L.A.'s population increased by about 30% and per capita income doubled, how, during a time of economic growth, do you go from this to this? I have not seen one polluted day in L.A. in my seven years there. I live in the fancy part of town close to the ocean. But this was a routine day, a hundred days a year in L.A. It looked like this in the 1970s. So how... Uh, notice that apparently there's mountains here. Here's downtown L.A., the Lakers play, uh, I think, here. The, um, how, 
do you get a green city during a time of economic growth? Do I have any optimists here about the future? Somebody, can, anyone want to tell an optimistic story of how urban economic growth greens a city? You, sir. I can't hear you, sorry. There's motorcycles out there. But LA, you're right, but LA didn't have that much manufacturing, so, so some oil refining left. But, so, so I do agree with you. So you're telling a story of a manufacturing to services transition, and that's certainly part of the story. What else could lead a city growing richer to make this transition? And do I have any optimists in this room? I'm the most optimistic man in America and maybe in Singapore. What causes progress? Cars. Cars cause this problem. How do they cause it? How do we get from, from this to this? Strict government controls on pollution. We have a student who's an A+. Plus. <laughs> to, to build on that student's answer, thank you, a, the, the introduction of the catalytic converter in the 1970s reduced California's emissions per mile dr driving by 99%. And so it, that government stepped up. While I come from the Libertarian University of Chicago, I have a very healthy respect for the role that government can play in improving our quality of life. For government to play this role, government needs to have the human capital and intellectual resources to enact policies. We need to have the engineering solutions at hand and we need to enforce these rules. And so the cleanup of Los Angeles is an example, uh, and I think we're gonna see this throughout Asia, as Asia's nations experiencing motorization begin to adopt uh, Euro standards and US standards for, for vehicle emissions per mile, that the Los Angeles example highlights the transition that cities can make during a time of vehicle growth vehicle emissions can plummet if emissions per mile declines faster than miles driven increases. And LA is the proof of this. Folks, here's Pittsburgh back a long time ago. This was when I was born. Hey, do, do you see those manufacturing smokestacks? Do you see the coal consumption? Do you see the steel? So this created good jobs for good Americans. Pittsburgh was part of the Rust Belt, creating the steel needed for all the infrastructure in the U.S. But this, of course, create, the particulate matter created by these factories created uh, incredible levels of pollution. Here's Pittsburgh today. Uh, we're celebrating the beauty of this Allegheny River. And this isn't such a beautiful picture. But you, you, this is now a city that revolves around Carnegie Mellon University and the University of Pittsburgh. Yes, so it's easy to say that it's made a post-materialistic transition from manufacturing to services. But folks, what was it about Singapore, about Singapore, what was it about Pittsburgh, that excellent universities at the University of Pittsburgh and Carnegie Mellon were there, and that the comparative advantage of this city went from being steel to being the brain? And it doesn't take rocket science to look at Singapore with the excellent universities here, and of what is the golden goose when you can attract and retain ambitious, skilled people, and if they are attracted to quality of life, then urban economic growth, you achieve urban economic growth because you have high quality of life. And so that's been the theme of my work for the last 20 years, that quality of life of a city is not just sort of a, a vacation, that for more and more college-educated people, and college education is occurring all over Asia and in the United States, Quality of life is the magnet for attracting and retaining ambitious, skilled people. So, a couple of slides. Uh, and let's see if I keep everybody awake. Folks, why do you want to bring up your household in a green city? How does it improve your household's quality of life? We all know from the epidemiology, well, let's start down here because maybe you don't know this. My friend Mike Haynes of Colgate University documented the following fact. In the year 1880 in the United States, a rural white male lived 10 more years than, a, a, than an urban resident. There was an urban mortality premium of 10 years because of dirty water in the United States. People moved to cities because the wages were so high, but it clipped off 10 years of their life. 
it is obvious, and I know everyone knows this, that clean air and clean water have direct effects on be enjoying leisure, being happy, and more and more research has documented on being productive, that you would learn less at NUS and working in Singapore if it was a more polluted environment. So a very important point coming out in a lot of research is on children's living up to their full potential. The Nobel laureate Jim Heckman has argued that in this skill formation age, learning begets learning, skill begets skill. If a child gets off to a bad start in life, the kid's never going to catch up. So if you meet a successful pe person from NUS or from Harvard, how did they achieve it? What a human capital theorist would say is some combination of luck, that child's endowments of talents, the investments by the parent, but also having access to good food, good health care, and the absence of pollution when that child was young. And so when, pe when I talk to people about the environment in the United States, they sometimes think they don't associate it immediately with our day-to-day -day quality of life. But a, to avoid pollution is crucial for a child getting off to a good start in life and living up to their full capabilities. Uh, and then in addition, you have these other factors that for adults and for seniors, pollution has negative impacts. And just in day-to-day -day quality of life, being down by the Marina Bay is much more pleasant if there isn't pollution. And this is my one slide on the case for green cities. So I've already mentioned this. I want to celebrate two friends of mine. How many of you have read Ed Glazer's Triumph of the City? Sophisticated crew. So I will crack a joke since nobody's laughing and folks are starting to sleep. I was speaking at the University of Chicago and a gentleman came up to me and handed me Ed Glazer's Triumph of the City. And I said, oh, thank you. And he said, I want, and he said to me, I want you to sign Glazer's book. And I said, you know, I've written several books. I don't sign other guys' books. And he said, uh, I'd like you to sign Glazer's book. And I said, why am I going to sign Ed's book? And, and Ed is a tenured professor at Harvard, and I, I'm on YouTube, I will say this. He's a terrific friend of mine, but I, um, I mean, he's done several things much more impressively than I have. And now I've got to sign his book. And, and the guy says, because in the, in the third part of the book, he talks extensively about his work with you, and since I can't find him, you should sign it. So, and so I signed it. I hope you like Ed's book. And I, Ed, Ed signed my name. But it's um, Enrico Moretti has written a terrific, both of these books are terrific. Uh, Glazer's Triumph of the City, Moretti's New Geography of Jobs. And what these two U.S. Glazer's book is international. Moretti's book is really focused on the United States. What both of these books emphasize is what I mentioned before, that in this skills economy, that the key to urban economic growth for a city, whether it's Singapore, whether it's Cairo, whether it's Bangkok, or whether it's Los Angeles, is those cities that can attract and retain the skilled. And again, my addition to this literature has been that quality of life, however you define it, quality of life, those cities that offer high quality of life can be confident uh, that they will attract and retain the skilled and that firms, there's an old chicken and egg literature. Do people follow jobs or do jobs follow people? When cities have high quality of life, workers will be attracted to live there and footloose firms will follow them. And while more work needs to be done on that claim, I would bet my son on that. And so if you care about Singapore, the key uh, for Singapore in an open system of cities across Asia is to continue to offer high quality of life. And yes, people will differ with how they define quality of life, but then it's up to the government to keep an eye on whether they're delivering uh, the services that people expect and want. So... I want to talk about, I'm going to repeat these points. Quality of life is California's golden goose. Folks, did you know if you wanted to buy all the land in Los Angeles, you would need $1.1 trillion? You're supposed to make a sound at this point. This is supposed to be a real estate room. Whoa, thank you. <laughs> Where does this value come from? Los Angeles is worthless. My productivity is down when I move to UCLA because I, I go outside to do exercise. There's nothing productive about Los Angeles. So it is not the case that real estate is valuable because you locate there and your IQ doubles. This is not goodwill hunting, uh, and I'm not Matt Damon. The reason real estate is worth $1.1 trillion in L.A., where you could buy Michigan for that amount of money, 
uh, it, that, that was a joke. You could probably buy the whole Northwest for that. Is because of the, of, of the great quality of life, of supply and demand for scarce land in heaven. Millions of people are voting with their pocketbook that they love California. I'm a homeowner who overpaid for a house, and I'm making a bet that California will continue to have great quality of life. And again, I've repeated this point twice now. In this footloose age where firms and people move regularly, those cities with great quality of life can be more confident about attracting and retaining the skill. Folks say, eh, boring. Let me come to a complete stop. Here, questions, or does anyone want to fight? And, 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 I, and I love the questions I've been asked so far. And, and I've already been fed tonight, so I can't even be put in a bad mood. Yes. So, so this is an excellent question, and it, 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 it comes back to some of his themes. And so here's what I would say. When everyone in this room, so how many folks here are planning to live in Singapore five years from now? I will include myself. And so, I, so for folks considering what's the best city for you, the, 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 the issues that an economist would say the rational planning that a person would go through is on the criteria would be first what is the objective reality in different cities you're considering. How do the cities score on these criteria? And then to his point about foreigners versus natives, what weight do they put on these factors? Do they care very much about street safety? Uh, one of the reasons so many Chinese students come to UCLA, while, it, while there's relatively few at the University of Chicago, I at first thought it was because of me. I get all these, every day I get 20 emails from China saying, Dear Professor Khan, you are famous, you are great, I would like to study with you. I, I, I used to believe this. It, 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 these. My colleagues at the University of Chicago say they only get two of these a day. I say, I really am better than you. But what's going on is that many in this group have a preference for Los Angeles over Chicago, and part of it is perceptions of street safety. And part of it is the wonderful climate, part is the successful Chinese community already in Los Angeles. And, and, and so, of course, you're right that for different groups, they will place different weights. But I think we can all agree that all of these are important, but different people might have placed different emphasis on these criteria. So to that point, if the leaders of Singapore are concerned about, especially concerned about the quality of life of people who already live here, they can survey their own citizens and ask, do you feel we're doing a good job on pollution? Uh, do you feel that the city has enough green space? And that would be one way to elicit reactions of the citizens to see in sort of a focus group setting of whether the people are happy with services. But I agree with you. Folks, here's a map of the United States, and I wanted to show you a couple of things. I wanted to show you that I was born uh, here, uh, here, met my wife here, now live here. But what I really wanted to show you, that was meant to be funny. What I meant to show you is notice that the U.S. population is not uniformly distributed. 13% of the U.S. land area is on the coast, but 51% of the population, and this number's gone up, and 57% of the money is in the dark shaded areas. The U.S. population is not uniformly distributed. There's a reason this is called flyover country. Uh, a, but of course there's a lot of talented people here, but a, a whole bunch of the United States has chosen to put itself in coasts. And so there's always fascinating issues for any city. So let me ask you a question. If you are the president of the United States and you know how to read a map, what thoughts go through your head about challenges for the United States in terms of quality of life? Why am I showing you this map? So at UCLA, because I quiz my students often, I'll just put something up and say, why? And there'll just be a, an embarrassing silence for 10, 15 minutes till someone says something smart. Yeah. 
So we've got millions of people in Florida. We've got this New Orleans here. Eh, so what? So another aspect of quality of life are natural disasters. There's a question of climate change and sea level rise. Eh, so so, there's, so eh, the Hurricane Sandy caused real damage here. So in my listing of quality of life challenges, we didn't list that if you are a coastal population of natural disaster risk, and if there is the anticipation that climate change may elevate such risks, then a, a benevolent government, uh, as I've read that Singapore has taken these steps, will take steps to protect coastal people. And so there's, I think there's very interesting issues there in real estate. So very valuable real estate in the United States is coastal real estate, but it's also at more risk from natural disaster. And there's interesting libertarian questions of whether people should be allowed to live in beautiful but risky areas or whether they should be nudged using zoning to move to higher ground. And so this is something that interests me very much, which I believe is highly relevant in Asia, uh, whether not only in Bangladesh, but in many parts of Asia at risk from climate change and of how as Asia cities grow, yes, there are amenity benefits of being in coastal areas, but of what risks people are exposing themselves to and what liability insurance companies potentially face. And for a benevolent government, what paternalism should it engage in to protect people? And this interests me very much. The, a couple of more points, I'm looking for T Tian Fu. How, how many more minutes till the, the, will you, there will be a demand for break? I'm just warming up. I'm sorry? Oh, good. So I will make that target. I want there to be no revolution. I want these lectures to go on till at least Wednesday night. Folks, we've already mentioned and we all know that educational attainment is rising both in the United States and in Asia. I have been very interested in the, from a variety of urban scholars' work, including research at NUS, urbanization and education go hand in hand. Very few PhDs are in rural areas. Uh, I would like to know how many NUS graduates work in farming communities. A education and urbanization go hand in hand. We all know that educational attainment in Asia is rising. Here's perhaps the more interesting point. I and several other, I, I started a literature uh, which, uh, which other guys have worked on, on the causal effect of education on being an environmentalist. So there's an interesting correlation that more educated people are more likely to say that they're an environmentalist and to live an environmentalist lifestyle. Now, so, for those who live in cities, I certainly understand that if you have no income, you may not eat much meat and you may have a small carbon footprint. We can come back to that. But all else equal, and no, no, that, that was not a joke. That uh, I was trying to be serious. <laughs> what the literature that I've worked on is the following. More there's a literature that more educated people are, are more patient people. A patient person is willing to sacrifice pleasure now for, for pleasure in the future. The story, a, a more educated person demands sophisticated news stories like the New York Times and is interested in the details of technical issues like climate change. And so as Asia and as the United States' educational attainment has gone up, this has created an interest group interested in supporting green cities. At the same time, as the United States has deindustrialized, there have been fewer and fewer men working in dirty jobs. And the, the reason that matters is if you worry you're going to lose your job if there's intense industrial regulation, you're going to oppose this stuff, just the very simple political economy theory. A, there is the theory in economics of self-interested voters. If you think you're going to lose your job because of intense regulation of factories, you're going to vote against it. And so uh, I'm going to skip this point in the name of time, but I'm very interested in Asia's nations where educational attainment is rising. Will more and more urban citizens demand green cities? And will the political leaders in those cities respond to this demand by the median voter? So next point, and somebody's cell phone is ringing. It's not mine. Life is about choice. You could walk out right now. Maybe you should. 
I tell my deans at UCLA, life is about choice. I may walk out right now. And they raise my pay. <laughs> and so those who can make a credible threat get what they want. In many, the United States, how many major cities does the United States have? It has 300. When you have 300 choices on the menu, you can find something that meets your needs. And what if something on the menu makes you sick? What if there's 300 restaurants located next to each other and one of them makes you sick? Do you go back to that restaurant again? This is competition. And so I'm fascinated by the following idea. If there's a mayor who he or she thinks, and of course I'm about to introduce the concept of the system of cities. If there is a mayor, whether it's the mayor of Buffalo or whether it's the mayor of some Chinese city, who has the hubris to think, no one's going to leave my city. I can do what I want. We don't have to pick up the trash. We, or we don't have to provide services that the people want. The people will migrate away from that city. In the United States, 3% of Americans move across states every year. For Asia cities to, pr to protect Asian urbanites, there, there needs to be a similar level of migration. In the United States, the willingness to migrate across cities has led to a national competition creating incentives for mayors to deliver services that people want. From basic economics, no city has a monopoly. So at UCLA, if we don't treat our students well, they will transfer to UC Berkeley or to another school. That competition among schools, that no school has a monopoly, incentivizes my school to do a better job. So UCLA could either teach well, because we just we love our students and we feel a responsibility to do so, or fear of competition. And both of those provide, a, both of those generate the same thing, excellent teaching at UCLA. So while many young people fear competition, competition's actually your friend, that it leads to excellence uh, because it gets people to do their job, uh, and whether they are mayors or whether they, they are senior faculty. And so a point that, uh, eh, let me come back. And so a very important point about quality of life in the modern city is if there is a city, if there is a mayor who does not take quality of life seriously, that people can vote with their feet and migrate to another city that offers better quality of life. That option, the threat of that option, incentivizes a mayor to step up and do his or her job. Now let me say some things from real estate, since several of you are real estate experts. A theme in my work has been that cities with higher quality of life. So folks, did you know, let me test you. I made the Wall Street Journal for the following point. Let me get my math right since I am, uh, yes. If you sell one Los Angeles house, how many Detroit homes can you buy? It's only 100. The exchange rate, I thought a house is a house. You can trade one Los Angeles house for 100 Detroit homes. Yet nobody does it. It's interesting. And so those cities with higher quality of life, I asked my UCLA students, you could buy a house in Detroit for $10,000. Aren't you guys going to go? And no one raises their hand. And it's those cities with higher quality of life have higher real estate prices, as we will discuss after break, if any of you are still here. If a government has a property tax, and I realize that China doesn't, but even in China with their land sales, you can sell the land at a higher price to developers if, the, if it's a higher quality of life area. Si Chi Zhang and I have documented that in a paper you all read in the Journal of Urban Economics. Hey, that was a joke. If government, if government has a property tax, then it collects more revenue in those cities with a higher quality of life. And that incentivizes mayors. Notice that key word incentive. That incentivizes mayors. For those mayors who value having a big public finance base to produce whatever infrastructure they want, the transitive logic here is as, is as follows. Those cities with higher quality of life will have higher real estate prices. For a given property tax system, they will have higher revenue base, and that makes the mayor more powerful. He or she controls a bigger pot. I want to switch topics and we may actually we, we may actually be on time. Folks, everything I spoke about up till now was about local quality of life. 
so subject to the excellent points you raised, we were focusing on the notice that notice that the word climate change, notice that the word carbon dioxide was nowhere here. When I mentioned pollution, I was meaning local water pollution and local air pollution. I now want to say something about low carbon cities and quality of life. So in the United States and in, all over Asia right now, there's great interest in low carbon cities. Something that would interest me very much, and this comes back to this diversity point, is if a city, has, if a city is a low carbon city, and so uh, do I have a picture? No, I don't. I apologize. Folks, why is Houston not a low carbon city? How many of you have been to Houston? I thought I asked that before. So why, why is Houston not a low-carbon city? What's going on in Houston? Walk me through the typical day I can put on my hat. What goes on in Houston? You drive. Why do you drive? Okay. It, it, gas is cheap, and there's sprawl. And by sprawl, we mean, is anyone living in a housing tower? People are living on an acre of land in a single detached house, which is 3,500 square feet, that they paid $250,000 for. And how far do they live from the city center? 30 miles. Do they ever go to the city center? Would they know public transit if they saw it? The, and these individuals on top of that have green lawns where water has been brought. Water actually is very carbon intensive because water's heavy and you have to use a lot of electricity to ship water across space. So Houston is about private consumption. Houston reflects the American dream of living in the suburbs in a large house in a humid place where you're using a lot of air conditioning, where you are driving, not using public transit, and you're not walking. But folks, who would that be attractive to? Is it obvious that that's a low quality of life city? We've, we've twice spoken about diversity. Who would find Houston an attractive city? What, what kind of household would find that very attractive? And four million people live in Houston, so you can't say nobody. So Houston is an oil center, but he, so you're right that there's refining there, but I reject the point that the people are living there just because of jobs. You, you can find a job somewhere else. And, but you, so you, you, it's not a law of physics that those jobs have to be there. Yes, the refining is attached there. But he, what, what kind of family would find Houston very attractive? So again, let me help you since folks want their cookie. I don't want to answer the question. You answer it. <laughs> what? I didn't hear a word you said. I just described Houston to you. It's 95 degrees each day. So I'll, I'll repeat myself. What I said, and you can watch this on YouTube later, is Houston has 95 degrees every day. It is a place where, uh, where housing is cheap, where it is car-based, and it, 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 is, it is a white and Hispanic population, and it is in Texas. So, but, so I would say that you could go look it up on YouTube. That, uh, you, 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 there's the University of Houston there. There is rice there. I have spent a week there myself. So since he wants to punt on the question, let me answer the question. Suppose that you're – I'm sorry? But, but you can have that everywhere. I mean, so you can have that in St. Louis. You can have that in Milwaukee. So, so what I would say about Houston is the following. If you're a guy who likes to golf, if you have four children, if you like to drive a Hummer, if you like to barbecue, if, if, if you like to drive, it's an ideal city. You're part of an air-conditioned country club, and, and, and you drive from place to place, and you live in your own sort of bubble. A very different city is low-carbon San Francisco, where, again, how many of you have been to San Francisco? San Francisco, with its absence of humidity, people don't need air conditioning. They don't need winter heating. They, there is, the electric utilities use natural gas or renewables rather than coal, as they use in Texas. Folks use public transit. Housing is quite expensive, and because demand curves slope down, people economize on housing consumption, living in towers and living a walking lifestyle. 
So who's going to be attracted to that? Why are there so many young, funky people in San Francisco? They care about the environment, but it's also a lifestyle and a vibe. So Houston is sort of, it might be for 47-year-old guys. If I had five or six kids, and if I had some job which paid well but not very well, you could live very well in Houston in a 3,500-square-foot house, while in San Francisco you might be in a 700-square-foot apartment. And that that, but that might be the good life for some people. Now, what Ed Glazer and I have studied, and I've already revealed my answer, is San Francisco. And folks, you could do this for Asian cities. You could compare Singapore to Bangkok. Uh, it, 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 San Francisco has a smaller, if the same household lives in San Francisco, that household has a smaller carbon footprint than if it lives in Houston, where the carbon footprint is how much do you drive, how much electricity do you consume, uh, and, and, and there's ways to add that up into a single formula. So Glazer and I have argued that San Francisco, because it's a lower carbon footprint, it beats Houston on global criteria, but we have just talked through that different people in the United States might rank these cities differently. So folks, the beauty of the menu of cities is that the United States offers both of these cities. So let me ask you a question. Would the U.S. be a stronger nation if we forced Houston to be like San Francisco? It would shrink America's carbon footprint, but it would shrink the freedom of America that there's some people with a taste for golf and driving around. And, and, and if, if those are your tastes, you have the right to engage in that. And, and Houston offers that. While the, it would be a horrible world if all of the U.S. was just like Houston, if you somehow San Francisco was converted into being Houston. And so this is my point about the system of cities, of having a menu of cities and allowing a diverse group of citizens to, to self-select where they want to live. And that's what I mean by diversity of tastes and priorities. So in Asia, I would ask you to think about a strong nation would have a system of cities, and I realize in Singapore with a single city that this is difficult, but there can be multiple neighborhoods, how you offer a menu of opportunities to allow diverse individuals to choose what's best for them. I want to see how many slides I have left. Okay, you guys have my notes. Hey, how many do I have left? I've got 10? So this is not good. So it's, uh, but I've got seven minutes. So folks, another thing I want you to think about as another criteria of sustainability and something I've worked on is climate change adaptation. So we were talking about that in the case of New Orleans. So I was saying that right now in the United States that millions of people are living in areas that could suffer greatly from sea level rise or from severe storms like when Hurricane Sandy hit. So another metric for sustainability besides for being a low carbon city, is also whether you can withstand shocks. Whether it, when there are shocks, how your city adapts. I wrote a book, so how many of you read my Climatopolis? The educated group. The, um, so Climatopolis, which was reviewed in The Economist and the Financial Times, and uh, which my son liked, uh, argued that capitalism will help us to adapt to climate change. And so it was a free markets book of the greatness of capitalism. It offended many environmentalists who, uh, for a variety of reasons we can talk about. But I want to convey two ideas from the book because I knew you didn't read it. We are busy people. The climate scientists, so an important idea, I'm a humble man. I know that there's many things I don't know. And that's the beginnings of being an intellectual of knowing what you don't know. The dangerous man doesn't know what he doesn't know. And so, but it, it, that there are known unknowns is the starting point for cities to adapt to climate change. There is a vector of activities. How many extra days is it going to be over 100 degrees in Singapore? Extreme rain, sea level rise, natural disasters. For urban planners, there's fascinating work for the cities that you are passionate about, about how they will be affected by these different categories. And if we can anticipate these challenges, we can solve them. The Titanic hit that iceberg. Why? It didn't see it. If it had seen it, what would the Titanic have done? Swerved. You're supposed to laugh. 
what's going to happen in the case of climate change is our nerds, uh, my Institute of the Environment colleagues, and I'm sure NUS has these men and women also, like Paul Revere, the climate scientists pro are providing more and more refined predictions of how different cities are going to be affected by climate change. If we trust our scientists that they're not politicians, that they're doing objective research. So in the United States right now, there's great skepticism. There's the belief that climate scientists are making stuff up because they want to get big grants from environmental agencies. I do not believe this. If the public trusts the climate scientists, then their updated forecasts of risks to cities will impact insurance prices and will impact economic activity. And I'd like to give an example. Folks, this is Los Angeles, and I want to do this in detail. I have a great colleague at UCLA. Everyone say Alex Hall, so I can show this to him on YouTube. Let's hear it. Alex Hall. Yay! So Alex is a professor of atmospheric and oceanic chemistry. And what he has done is he has, he has made the five... Let me slow down, because I'd love to do this well. Folks, this is Los Angeles. I live six... Here's the Pacific Ocean. Uh, I live six miles in from Santa Monica, so USC is right here, UCLA is right here, Caltech is kind of here, Vegas is sort of over here. Here is what Alex has done. He has used a climate change model to predict within Los Angeles how many days over 95 degrees. So in Celsius, what is 95 degrees? Is that 33? 34, 35. So here's what he's doing. He is the, the mustard color. What color would you say this is? The yellow color is the current count of days. So in the red lens, which is right here, the, the further east you go, the further east you go from the ocean, the hotter it gets. Currently, the red lens, this community here in Los Angeles, suffers from 12.3 extremely hot days per year. Does everyone see that according to his model, it's expected to rise by the year 2050 to 40.7 hot days? So we can subtract this from this. He is claiming that on average, climate change is going to raise the red lens number of hot days by 28 days per year. Folks, contrast that with coastal Santa Monica. Do you see zero and zero? Folks, how is Los Angeles going to adapt to climate change? What did I say in my book that you didn't read? It got so bad with my book, my nine-year-old son was writing Amazon reviews anonymously, attacking my critics. <laughs> my own mother didn't like my book, and she, she's going to watch this YouTube. And so, folks, what, where would a rational planner, there's 10 million people in L.A., where are we going to rebuild Los Angeles? In Santa Monica. We're going to rebuild, and I don't want to hear about earthquakes. The engineers have figured that out. But folks, what's blocking? Why are there so many single-family homes in Santa Monica right now? In real estate, do you discuss something called zoning? Can I spell that for everyone? Z-O-N-I-N-G? It is zoned single-family housing. So I fought all these old grannies. I say all of Santa Monica needs to be rezoned for housing towers. It needs to make Hong Kong style density. At Hong Kong style density, you can move millions of people into the cool core of the city. We are always rebuilding our cities. China has shown that you can build cities with millions of people in just a couple of years. If we anticipate this heat in land, why does anyone have to keep living here if you could rezone to build up in the temperate area? And so a major theme in my work has been about reimagining our cities. And I believe this has implications in Asia, but because I, I do more work in China than in the rest of Asia, I'm not qualified to talk about this. But I want you young people to show more imagination of when we anticipate a sustainability threat, a quality of life threat. If our scientists give us kosher predictions of how the city's geographic area will be affected, can we reimagine the city such that Los Angeles continues to thrive? And that's an open question, but I'm optimistic that we can. Yes, oh, gosh, last slide. You guys are going to get your cookie. The things I, when I've, been on the, when I've been on the NUS campus and I've blogged about this, I love the building ventilation. It's hot in Singapore. Has anyone noticed? And so the city comes to life at night. 
there's very interesting ways that the buildings are cooled and how to take advantage of breezes. There's fascinating issues of how you handle urban heat island effects to minimize the discomfort from extreme heat. I'm going to talk later on about the smart grid and other technologies for providing the energy for air conditioning. But a very important idea before we go to break are these two points. When we anticipate a challenge, folks, a ch one person's challenge is another person's opportunity. Mark Zuckerberg is now worth $30 billion because there were people who wanted to befriend and like things. He anticipated that if he built something, that there was a need in this social network world to be connected. I now know more about my high school classmates from 30 years ago than I wanted to know. And now I don't want to see them anymore, now that I've seen the bald guys and the children. But I, we can come back to that in break. Zuckerberg anticipated a demand for that technology and solved the problem. Capitalism, when we anticipate these challenges of new opportunities in a variety of fields, Final point before break. In the case of Facebook, billions of ordinary people like me enjoy Facebook, but I have no idea how the computing works. We only needed one team in Facebook to perfect that technology for us all to benefit from it. Ideas are public goods. If Singapore comes up with an excellent strategy for helping its people to adapt to heat conditions, then people in Los Angeles can learn from the Singapore experience. And so I'm going to be talking in these lectures about the guinea pig and my optimism about social learning and how best practices, once best practices are discovered by, by urban planners and by government officials, they can broadly spread. And Tianfu, I'm, lecture number one is now done. Uh, where can a cookie be found? Thank you, folks. Do I need to stay mic'd? I'm kidding. Was that okay?